So. Mark Lemon got his bachelor's at Plymouth and his master's at Tartu, University of Tartu, Department of Semiotics there. And needless to say, that's where we met. And it must have been something like 2011, ancient history. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, he's worked at Science Salad for like 10 years, damn near. Isn't that right? Yeah, very nearly, very nine and a half as we speak right now. So, yes. As you know, Science Salad is the most prestigious. Uh, Commercial Semiotics Agency in UK. I hope that you've had a chance to check out their website. Uh, he's an expert monoboarder, which is like skiing and like snowboarding, but it's like a hybrid of the two, if you've never heard of that. And uh, I, he does a lot of brand research abroad. He's done quite a bit of trips on Science Salad Dime to research brands like tea and beer and, and so on. And these are the really interesting stories. And uh, he... And share screen. I had actually uh, uh, jokes to make. I had some jokes to make, but I preemptively stopped my share screen. But anyway, uh, this is well, I go I googled Mark and Semiofest, because Semiofest is the kind of leading commercial semiotics festival. It's a conference, I guess, commercial semiotics conference, and Mark's regular there. And it was in Tallinn in, in Estonia, same country as, as Tartu, uh, back in 2016. And so Mark was there, and I was there, and Al Deacon was there, too, uh, who's going to be our speaker, uh, I think, maybe two weeks from now. Another great commercial semiotation. Well, Al was there, too, and I was wondering, I was wondering, is this this photo because you can see it's me here i'm introducing mark and i don't remember doing that because we got up some business <laughs> the night before of this talk i think or actually i can't remember i can't even remember if it was before this talk or after that talk but al was with us though and maybe in two weeks when al's with us then we can share even more salacious details about our uh, nighttime exploits at semi business as is usual to the academic conference yeah so now is the time that i stopped sure and and uh continue with my introduction to uh to mark how many science salads i mean uh how, how many semi fests have you been to mark uh, i think oh. at this point it's about four maybe five i'm, I'm not sure but i have been uh, a little neglectful the last few years I'll admit. upcomings so, in in portugal it is yeah it's in porto this year so uh i sadly won't be there myself but i would definitely encourage anyone who's interested uh it's a great gathering of people and uh the the theme is around the semiotics of liminality this year, so I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting uh, discussion around that. Yeah, we, we actually thought of making a pitch to have it in all months in a couple of years, maybe, but we haven't actually run it by Chris or MC or anybody yet. So maybe we will at some point. But so without further ado, if you'd like to share your screen and begin with your talk. Of course. So, yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining this. Uh, slightly... Uh, well, eclectic, I don't know, perhaps not as focused as it might be talk, but I'm going to cover just a few general principles from uh, the world of applied semiotics, commercial semiotics, however you might want to think about it. And then I'm also going to uh, yeah, talk through some examples and then a little bit more of kind of theoretical or the application of some theoretical uh, frameworks to uh, commercial challenges and ways in which that might be done a way in which I've found productive and useful in my experience and um, I've also just kind of thought maybe in my, my pre-reading immediately before this uh, uh, perhaps a little bit of a link actually between the theoretical framework that I'll talk about and um, some of the elements in, in the reading from Sean Cubitt so uh I might at the end improvise a little bit of a link there as well, which might be useful, might be foolhardy, but uh, we'll see when we get there. But uh, yeah, I look forward to, I can see there's comments in the chat already. Um, I will uh, probably only get to those at the end of this, but do please comment in things there as you, uh, as you, as you, as we go through. Uh, so uh, yes, as mentioned, so my, my name is, uh, is Mark Lemon. I am, I am a director at Science Salad in the UK, based in the UK, but working globally. So 
and I've gone through the, the my journey into commercial semiotics has been entirely at Science Island. I started there, as Tyler mentioned, nearly 10 years ago as an intern um, when I was just a year or so out of um, out of my studies at Tartu. Uh, so I've been through a journey on that time from you know being very hands on at the kind of forefront of of of, of cultural research. Um, through to increasingly taking perhaps a more strategic and a more kind of uh, overview of projects and, and working with and directing my colleagues. So during that time, I've, I've kind of had a, a broad range of experience and involvement in a variety of different projects. But what my role now affords me to do a little bit more is think about uh, how we express the value and benefit of semiotics and, and, and primarily uh, to our commercial clients. So there are a couple of principles that I increasingly find myself circling around that I think are key to our approach to our, our benefit. And, and those are specifically distinctiveness and relevance. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about those. We then might do a little bit of a category exercise, uh, looking at a category I did some work in a few years ago, the T category. We'll see a little bit, I, I hope time permits that. I definitely then want to get into the, the slightly more theoretical aspect of looking at the use of Roman Jakobson's model of communication and how that can be applied to packaging and advertising. And then hopefully as well, some time for discussion and Q&A at the end of all that. Okay, so uh, semiotics. Um, well, or applied semiotics. Um, so obviously, we are dealing with brands typically um and brands are as it says on this chart just to, to to kind of read out literally in a rather bland way they're inseparable from the culture that surrounds them they are cultural artifacts while they offer us products that purport to have some sort of functional benefit to our lives and and and, and you know may well fulfill various functional roles our choice to buy, say, a Pepsi versus a Coca-Cola is not about the respective functionality of, of each product. It's about the cultural meaning of those brands and the associations that they bring to the table. So when we interpret, we see that can of Coca-Cola on the shelf. We don't see it in isolation. We look at it through a series of lenses. We look at it, firstly, through the lens of culture at large and specifically food and drink culture and the increased discussion around high sugar content in foodstuffs and whether or not that is bad, good for our health. We will also look at it through the lens of the category. And maybe in this case, there might be considerations around the craft soda movement. So if you think a few years ago, we had the craft beer movement that fundamentally changed and broadened our appreciation for a wide range of more unusual niche handmade styles of beer. Similarly, in soda, we are seeing the kind of uh, the green shoots of a craft soda movement, which are also starting to affect how we perceive this overtly mass produced product, Coca-Cola. We also then look at what key competitors are doing. You know, maybe Pepsi just last week have launched a new campaign that communicates that they are all whizzy and exciting and new and fresh. And is that going to make Coca-Cola suddenly seem a bit dustier and older by comparison? All of these things and more are brought to bear when we interpret that sign, a bundle of signs of the can on the shelf. So, as it says, to restate the thesis, brands are inherently inseparable from the culture that surrounds them. And if we try to manage, control, help brands without paying attention to those layers of culture, category, and competitor, um, we can fundamentally mislead, misguide, and not understand the overall situation. Excuse me, sorry, just taking a moment to load. So, Within that, then, there are two key principles that, as I mentioned, I want to, to drill into, uh, specifically distinctiveness and relevance. And as I hope to show you, dramatic brand growth can be achieved by brands that successfully embody both of these principles simultaneously. Um, you really do need both. If you are distinctive but not relevant, then no one is going to, people will know who you are, but they won't buy you. If you are relevant but not distinctive, people won't know you exist. So you might have a great offering for them, but they, they won't be able to find you. So they are both 
equally as important within this. And they are both linked to some very core semiotic principles. Apologies, my screen is taking ages to load between the slides. So we'll have another quick pause here. Hopefully it resolves itself. No worries. This, uh, <laughs> this no uh, latency effect is, I guess, another important aspect of the uh, the kind of networks uh, that's exactly, like you're yeah, talking it's about. Delay. Yeah, it's, it's a feature. Easy. It's a feature, not a bug. Indeed, indeed. Um, so let's see. Uh, distinctiveness. Distinctiveness gets you noticed. So as mentioned, if a brand doesn't stand out, it cannot accrue meaning. So I think if we return to um you know our uh our sociure even and we can think about the kind of imagery which he talks about the kind of plane of sound and the way in which language cuts pieces of the the sort of plane of sound and attaches meaning to those pieces those pieces need to be distinct they need to be different if they all sound the same it's nearly impossible or would be functionally impossible to create a meaningful language and this is also reflected in Derrida's concept of difference in the fact that actually it's the differences that, that make the meaning the meaning is maybe not contained within the individual units it's the relationships and differences between those units uh, that are vital to creating a meaningful system so if you want a brand to be meaningful it it, it therefore follows that it needs to be distinctive it needs to be different so how do you make a brand distinctive? Well, here are some examples taken from uh, advertising from the last few years in a few categories. And the kind of quickest, easiest uh, way of doing this is to directly challenge uh, and subvert some of the um, sort of cultural truths associated with a category or a space. So we have this advert here in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, taken uh, from the tube in, in London. If any of you have experienced that, you'll see there's a lot of signage there where, and, and announcements that are always telling you to mind the gap, to, to stand back from the platform, to avoid uh, coming to some harm. Now, this brand, interestingly named Dead Happy, who are a life insurance brand, uh, have directly subverted this uh, by telling you directly that never mind the gap, it's the train you need to worry about. They're directly manifesting the kind of the, the threat of death. They are subverting this uh, well-established sign of no, with, with respect to mind the gap to directly challenge some of the unspoken and surface, some of the, the usually unspoken aspects within the life insurance category and framing themselves, therefore, as refreshingly honest life insurance. Um, similarly, I think if we look at a brand like Oatly, a very high profile example with their campaigns, I really love this example where it says ditch milk. And of course they are you know they they are a, a milk alternative brand but they are present on the shelves next to a wide variety of milk products many other brands traditionally uh, let's think of a brand like alpro for example who offer a you know a soy milk or an oat milk product they will try to minimize their difference from uh, dairy milk and they'll tell you how similar they are and, and they will try and make their packaging look exactly the same as the dairy milk brands and really reduce that gap so that it doesn't seem like you're losing anything by buying Alpro instead of cow's milk but Oatly have taken directly the opposite approach they have emphasized their difference uh, by saying things like it's like milk but made for humans again to really surface and make themselves as distinctive as possible within that category. So all of these examples, I won't speak through the other ones, but hopefully they're fairly clear. There are ways of, um, of directly challenging category conventions to make yourself distinctive. But what is also relevant as mentioned, uh, sorry, what is also important is the need to be relevant. So you can't be different just for different sake. That difference has to have uh, a meaningful, um, application to the lives of consumers be something that they would desire now why is this important well culture changes all the time and i know you've been uh reading with connecting with you raymond williams uh who divides culture into these spaces of kind of residual dominant and emergent and 
it is a key theme of the British School of Commercial Semiotics that this model um, was brought into this space by Malcolm Evans. Um, and he's used that uh, as a way of communicating to brands their need to be aware of cultural change and align themselves with emerging cultural meanings if they are to continue to have relevance in the lives of consumers. Because basically, excuse me, sorry. Um, basically, this is a very crudely drawn bell curve, but uh, most brands, or the number of brands within a given category, the distribution of them probably sits something like this, where most of them are kind of floating around in this dominant space where if they don't do anything, as culture changes and moves, they will start to float towards that past residual space where they will lose meaning for consumers and they will stop being so relevant. They will become irrelevant to consumers. The dominant space is not necessarily a bad place to be in terms of being there right now, but if you want to continue your relevance or indeed get ahead of your com competitors, uh, what we help brands do is understand emergent culture, these green shoots of new meaning that are coming through in a category or space and allow brands to employ those codes, cues and meanings before their competition so that as those emergent meanings move into the mainstream, brands can experience uh, a growth in their cultural relevance and therefore also their, their sales. So these examples are probably a couple of years old now that I maybe should have updated these because they're perhaps not as relevant as they once were but they are examples of ways in which brands have changed to try to become more relevant so you're probably familiar with the global uh mass market lager brand Carlsberg who for a long time in the UK marketed around this slogan probably the best beer in the world and this was really an iconic asset for that brand the sort of asset that brands conventionally are very wary to mess with they don't want to touch it they don't want to change it it's well established in the minds of consumers but they realized in the context of the craft beer movement for example that I mentioned earlier their mass-produced lager it seemed incredibly insincere for them to continue to claim to be the best beer in the world when so many other brands had access to narratives around small batch craft, around high quality ingredients, around attentive care and expertise from professionals, that really this was no longer impactful. So they did this campaign that I think was, was very smart of them. They directly subverted change their slogan from probably the best beer in the world to probably not the best beer in the world and then responded to that with so we've changed it they used the fact that they were out of step they acknowledged the fact that they were out of step with culture they used that as stimulus to change to update their visual identity to update their recipe their marketing communications and create a whole new identity around this they still kept hold of core aspects of the brand like their logo for example but they moved on in so many other ways and embraced more contemporary design aesthetics. We can also see some other examples here, the way in which Nike uh, you know, made themselves more culturally relevant by being the kind of the first uh, large brand to support a spotlight Colin Kaepernick um, during the, the, the times of his protest with respect to Black Lives Matter. So that maintained and helped them grow a sense of cultural relevance as well by engaging with these contemporary issues uh it's not always though just about communications it's, it can also be about packaging design now this is a, a little bit of a, maybe bragging at this point in that this is a project that i was involved with a few years ago now probably seven maybe even eight years ago uh for the mayonnaise brand hellman's um and the packaging design that you see on the left is as it was when we started the, the project. Uh, we then did a cultural exploration into values such as naturalness, premiumness, craft, and worked with them to help come up with a palette of signs and symbols that they could employ to update their packaging, their visual identity, to create something that would be more aligned with the cultural values uh, around those ideas at the time. And this is something that I'm particularly, uh, particularly pleased with because they really uh, bought into our recommendations. And as a result, they have a pack design, which, as I say, this was some seven or eight years ago. I still feel looks contemporary, looks relevant 
on the shelves now and i believe will have you know good life for the brand still for another five or so years yet i think you know maybe even longer um because they were very um bold in embracing the codes and cues that we told them at the time uh and created something that really did reach into those emerging cultural spaces okay so uh how can distinctiveness and, and relevance be brought together then? So an uh, interesting example, if we look at the water category, we know that water brands for a long time have been marketed around a sense of life and youthfulness and the kind of the, the, the purity of the product brings for you. So we see campaigns showing babies or slogans that talk about purity and implicitly innocence with kind of fairy dust and angel wings and a sense of kind of sparkle creating this link culturally between water and youthfulness and longevity uh, a category therefore that offers you this kind of lively inherent uh, benefit however when we think about wellness uh, over the last few years wellness discourse has started to evolve quite significantly in the dominant narrative it was still is in many places a narrative of virtuous practice so language would talk about purity or if you think of the smoothie brand innocent directly using that kind of moral language in their brand name or brands like good culture the language itself around a kind of cleanse the removing of the body of the kind of the sort of dirt and decay uh, that might build up over time all of which framed wellness as this clean virtuous practice but actually, emergently, what we started to see when conducting some analysis was that this is changing quite profoundly. And actually, people don't want to be thinking of their decisions as being uh, sort of moral, necessarily. We all like those moments of indulgence, of enjoyment. And actually, we saw a number of brands increasingly embracing language that referred instead to sin or to rebellious action that reclaimed terms from the space. So language like rebel or slut or rude within this, um, all of which were being used alongside aesthetics that frequently draw upon alternative pop culture. So they use kind of like tattoo inspired illustration and a much more reverent tone of voice to code wellness as this space of rebellious action. So we have two things here. We have a category with respect to the water category that communicates a lot about youthfulness uh, and its kind of purity and inherent worthiness. And we have the cultural conditions which suggest that that narrative is actually increasingly being supplanted by something that is much more rebellious, edgy and challenging. And the result of this uh, is not work that we did, but it's very astute work. Uh, that was done either by someone or perhaps just intuited by the founder of the company, that there was a space in culture, a distinctive space in culture for a water brand that marketed itself as a kind of edgy alternative uh, to those brands that were all about purity and death. And they literally built in that alternative message into the name of the brand by calling themselves liquid death. Uh, so as opposed to that narrative of purity and youth, this is liquid death. Um, and this not only was distinctive within the category because it broke with that narrative of youthfulness, but it was relevant. It chimed well with that emerging narrative of wellness. And so the brand since their 2019 launch you know, grow hugely over 4,000% up to the year 2022. And you may have heard they also did a very high profile campaign around the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago that also got them a lot more uh, exposure. So I'm sure they're still growing as well. So they, they've they gone through a really impressive journey. And I think that's been achieved, whether consciously or unconsciously, by a very astute approach to culture, by understanding the changes within culture and the opportunity to break with that established narrative in this distinctive and relevant way. Okay, uh, let's see, where are we at time-wise? Okay, I have an example now of an opportunity to look at a category, but I think 
we might return to this, but I think I'm going to skip through it for now. Uh, but just to say, I was going to talk through the T space and offer you an opportunity to pull out some of the key codes and cues within this. But some of the things that I would observe within this, I think there's some interesting language around exploration, for example. So explore our best selling T's. Um, or lose yourself in a world of tea. So that sense of framing tea as inherently explorative of the T2 brand, also naming their blends after geographic locations is another way of doing that as well. There are obviously some narratives here around value, savers, great value, for example. There's also stuff here that borrows from uh, typically Eastern religious practices. So references to yogi, for example, or Zen uh, coming through this. And there's language as well that uses the kind of poetic function. So Poppin Praline or Beach Bellini or the Soothing Serenity blend um, to communicate this kind of rich poetic uh, experience. Just a few things that, that come out from this, but uh, as I say, we won't drill too much into that. But what I want to speak to you now about is Roman Jakobson's model of communication, which I hope you have some uh, familiarity with. I appreciate it's not a particularly modern uh, model, perhaps not used uh, that much in, in, in cutting edge semiotic thinking. Uh, nevertheless, I have found it to be useful as a thinking tool uh, for some challenges we face with clients, uh, particularly around the analysis of packaging and advertising and looking at how these different functions can be brought to bear within this. So um, yes, in terms of the model itself, this breaks down any instance of communication into six constituent uh, factors. Uh, components. Uh, so the addresser and the ad who addresses an addressee, and they do so uh, with reference to a certain context and using a certain message through a kind of channel that allows them to have contact and through an agreed uh, code or set of, of, of kind of uh, agreed meanings. And for this model, uh, Jacobson uh, sort of applies to each of these elements a different communication function that can be addressed by engineering the message in such a way as to particularly point towards uh, respective elements. So a message that particularly points towards the addresser, for example, um, aligns with the emotive function. A message that particularly points towards the context aligns with the referential function, if that makes sense. And so to give you maybe an example uh, of a message that points towards the addresser, if I tell you a lot about what happened on my weekend, you know, that language, I and my, the use of those kind of pronouns referring to myself, are straight away kind of linking you back or pointing you back towards myself uh, and particularly if I start to address my feelings with respect to to something I found this particularly challenging this upset me I enjoyed this aspect you can see within that I am relating my personal and subjective experience uh, which is therefore calling on this this emotive function uh, within language okay now that is a model uh, for communication in general, um, and specifically for communication using written or spoken language. Uh, excuse me. However, um, of course, not all communication is through written or spoken language. Um, and there are many instances of communication that happen as I've shown you uh, earlier in this document, between brands and individuals that may use other visual signifiers. They use color palettes, they use shapes of packaging. Uh, they will use language, um, but they might also use sounds, textures, um, and other visual elements in order to communicate with the person viewing the, the packaging or the advert. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to link up each of Jacobson's communication factors with a corresponding factor in the commercial situation. So instead of an addresser, in his model, the person sending the message, 
we have a brand. The brand is the entity in this case sending the message. Instead of an addressee, the person reading the message, we have the consumer. Um, get that person receiving, seeing the packaging, seeing the advert when they are sat at home watching the TV or walking down the aisles of their local supermarket. The context um, in this case is particularly that of commer commercial culture and commerce and the transactions between consumers and brands through a financial means. Uh, the message in this case might be the advert or pack, as mentioned, the contact is usually the visual channel, uh, whether that be TV advertising, print advertising um, or packaging. And the code, again, is the familiar visual and linguistic conventions. Uh, the code is not really changed in, in this uh, adaptation of the model other than to embrace more visual uh, elements within it and just expand the definition slightly. Um, okay, so uh, within that then, what are some of the signifiers that might be, if we take that as correct, and, and it certainly is open to question and critique, and I'm very interested to hear any of your thoughts that you might have about it, but uh, within that, uh, if that is the case, that the brand is the addresser, what therefore would be some of the signifiers that would evoke the emotive uh, the emotive function, for example? So, for example, uh, I've identified perhaps the face of a brand ambassador or using gendered typographies to imply something about the identity of the addresser. Are they male, female? Are they happy, sad? Uh, typography can be a great vehicle for these kind of messages. Um, also things like image filters or, or language that suggests a kind of historical uh, time frame within which the brand sets itself. So is this, you know, um, Farmer John's old timey cleaning syrup, you know, and it's in a kind of sepia tone packaging that would all tell you something about the brand, about their heritage, about their identity and implicitly also about their, their values. The addressee, okay, how is the addressee uh, communicated or targeted through this kind of uh, communication situation. So the use of you, here's what this product can do for you, or for and after imagery. So this is what the, the, the consumer used to look like. This is what they now look like, is directly highlighting the impact that it's going to have on the consumer. So that would fulfill the connative function. Context, as mentioned, referring to the, the kind of surrounding situations, so references to price, value, imagery of coins, enlarged price labels, all, all kind of refer to that. Uh, the messaging, the message aspect, how can a brand communicate the poetic function through packaging, for example? Well, by referencing and highlighting its own materiality, so adding layers to the packaging and textures and embossing or other decorative components or noise-making components that highlight the texture uh, integrity and material nature of the pack itself. It's not just a vehicle for you to get goods. It has its own, uh, its own meaning, its own life, its own richness uh, to it. Contact, so phatic communication is usually uh, performed through bright colors, unusual packaging shapes, anything that's eye catching that draws you in, that when you're doing that kind of scanning, walking down the supermarket aisle, makes you notice it, makes you catch attention. And then code could be, or the metalingual function, any language that clarifies the imagery or supports other elements, signifiers working together. So I have some examples here. I won't talk through all of them, but for example, the brand Deliciously Ella, for example, can use the emotive function by giving you this, this figurehead, this figure uh, Ella uh, prominently in their communications and also using typography that is lowercase, that is kind of, it has these curved elements. It's not script typography, but it does have uneven stroke weights. So it slightly implies a sense of, of hand touch within it and a general sense of kind of softness and care. So that all comes through that. The conative function uh, is communicated variously in advertising that might address you in a variety of ways. The referential function as mentioned, any kind of sales messaging, um, you know, this product right now is 60% off what it would usually be. Um, so grab it or lose it. The poetic function, use in the same way with language, highlighting the texture of language itself through alliteration or rhyme, for example. Or I think Guinness is a brand that's very uh, adept at using the poetic function in their communications more generally. They've had a variety of campaigns of late 
that highlight the visual similarity, the iconic that iconic visual of the pint of Guinness and how that might look like a bollard, or in this case, a sofa on a black background or other elements, sort of using and playing with that image in a poetic way. Uh, Fatic communication can be achieved by using very eye-catching neon colours, uh, to, again, to, to help uh, individuals recognise and spot the brand out in the world. Uh, and the kind of intersemiotic or metalingual function is performed by uh, explainer videos such as the the video introducing Facebook's new name as Meta, for example. So explaining and, and, and using text to support that change. Um, one thing we do notice is, is that certain categories might have certain biases towards certain communication functions. So when we look at a luxury space, um, I would argue that a lot of these communications are using the poetic function. They create a kind of visual poetry they are abstract and non-literal in what they communicate. They arrange the elements in unusual ways that self-consciously draws your attention to the fact that this is a composed image or a composed piece of text. So this Louis, Louis Roderer uh, champagne communication, for example, very subtly outlines the shape of a bottle, but using this upturned, broken kind of branch to poetically communicate a sense of sophistication and naturalness. Um, but we also see other ways in which this uh, advert subverts the conventions uh, by rotating uh, a uh, the shoe by 90 degrees to better fit into the kind of horizontal visual plane, again, making you aware of the visual medium within which you're communicating this very uh, overt way. So fulfilling this role as a kind of visual poetry. Uh, other categories, so craft beer, for example, typically these brands do not have budgets for uh, very uh, large marketing campaigns. So if they want to be distinctive, they cannot, or it's difficult for them to put out into the world a slogan that people are going to remember. Um, the simplest way for them to be distinctive is to be very brightly coloured and to have very memorable illustration styles. So when we look within craft beer, you straight away, you see a lot of very bright different colors and a lot of very distinct and creative illustration styles, fulfilling that need for distinctiveness, but also aligning this category with the fatic uh, function of communication, opening up that channel between uh, brewer and consumer. Okay, um, if you'd like to know more about the use of Jacobson's model of communication specifically for, for packaging, but I've tried to expand it a bit more into advertising within this presentation as well. Uh, there is an article that you can access online uh, in the American Journal of Semiotics, details of which can be seen on the screen now. And if you'd like to just keep in touch and up to date with what's going on in commercial semiotics, uh, feel free to follow myself on LinkedIn and also Sign Salad. Uh, we regularly post little articles, think pieces, things like that. And from time to time, we do have internships as well that come around. So um, there may be information that's useful uh, to you down the line. But I would like now to maybe uh, open up the floor to a bit of discussion. And I'm going to provide just my final short thought and provocation, uh, just responding to uh, the Sean Cubitt article, uh, because I think it's it's very interesting. And I agree with a lot of what they say about, um, about networks and the, the challenges that they bring to bear. And I'm possibly being a little bit unfair and moving the goalposts here, but I'm interested in the fact that they refer frequently to communication networks. And I think an argument can be made that actually the internet, uh, the various networks in which we are entangled right now are maybe not actually communication networks in terms of fulfilling those six functions of Jacobson's model of communication. They can become communication networks, but actually I think frequently what they offer us is just this contact function. They allow us to create a channel between ourselves and a favorite celebrity or a friend across the street or however. They allow us that mode of fatic communication to reach out to prod to poke if you remember the early days of facebook with the poke function that's directly a kind of fatic uh means of, of communication um but they don't obligate 
a response. Um, it's very easy with these remote networks to simply claim, oh, I didn't see that message. I did. So a, a dialogue is not necessary to be entered into in a way in which it is perhaps with face-to-face -face communication. Because for example, if I say something to Tyler and we're in the room together and he flat out ignores me, okay, maybe we've not entered into a dialogue, but I know for sure that he has heard me and I know that his lack of response is a conscious communicative choice because presumably I have offended him or I have said something inappropriate or something that he doesn't want to get into right now. That seems to me to be a communicate an instance of communication that has all of these, these elements. But actually, the networks that Sean Cuban is talking about do not necessarily always possess all of these. And, and maybe what is sometimes being confused is that we think of these as communication networks. And actually they are often, as I say, to return to my original point, they're often actually networks of contact, or, uh, um, which if the individuals use them correctly or choose to enter into the dialogue, they can become communication networks. But that is maybe where the challenge is. And I'm not familiar with Haraway's work, but I think there's a lot of obviously positive social value in communication in that rich sense but i can completely see that there is negative challenging social social value in just being contacted all the time and poked and prodded in this way and when he talks about the kind of mass to one communication in his paper i think that is actually maybe expressing that that we are always being prodded by adverts and things all times from different angles and that can be a repressive experience perhaps anyway sorry i've gone a little bit off on a soapbox angle there but i should also say as well obviously i work in marketing and i do believe that good advertising and good brand communications will fulfill all of these functions these are the contact function is you know is just that annoying pop-up that comes up and blocks your reading the contact aspect, but actually better advertising, better brand communication of necessity. It needs to have an element of contact to open up that channel with you, but it should also provide other richer communication uh, to support that. So that's my slight uh, slight provocation. Feel free, as I say, to, to disagree with that, uh, but it's just a thought that came came to mind coming into this. Anyway, thank you. That's it from me, but very happy to hear any any thoughts or answer any questions. Well, that was fabulous. I will stop recording now. Mm -hmm.